As earthquakes strike Haiti and Chile. This is a minute of shaking. What makes the earth move and what about Canada? We will have a devastating earthquake. So we've had them in the past and we undoubtedly will have them again in the future. On News and Review today, earthquakes, the horror and the science. Hello, I'm Carla Robinson. In late February, the South American country of Chile was rocked by a powerful earthquake and the world held its breath because just over a month before, another strong earthquake killed more than 200,000 people in the Caribbean country of Haiti. And this earthquake was 500 times more powerful. The quake struck about 115 kilometers from the city of Concepcion and about 300 kilometers south of the capital, Santiago. The powerful shocks ripped up roads and damaged buildings and homes in the city of Concepcion, and they were followed by tsunamis that swept through coastal communities. Frightened people camped in parks and streets, and in some places, looting broke out. But because the epicenter of the quake was further away from densely populated areas than the one in Haiti and deeper underground, and because Chile is a richer country and was better prepared, only about 500 people were killed there compared to more than 200,000 in Haiti. But damage was estimated at about $30 billion. And as the CBC's Connie Watson reported, entire communities were devastated. The sign says it all. The disaster is right here. This entire neighborhood was underwater a week ago. Surging waves drowned nine people and smothered homes in a thick layer of mud. Enrique Idoro walks through what's left of Santa Clara, streets filled with everyone's belongings, left there by the waves or tossed there by families sorting through the ruins of their homes. Neighbors died on this street, trapped in their houses by the water. I pulled out two bodies with my own hands on Thursday, he says. City Councilor Hernan Pino reads from a list of the dead. The body of one man was wrapped around a nearby power pole. He says his community is being ignored. We need the contaminated water cleaned up. We need medical treatment, protective gloves and drinking water, he says. Santa Clara is about two kilometers from the ocean, so it wasn't the tsunami wave itself that washed through this community, but it was the force behind it that sent the water higher and higher and higher. Jorge Pacheco's block was first to be hit. He says his neighbor grabbed onto the gate next door, braced his foot against the house, and held on for dear life as the water rushed right over top of him. The water filled the first floor of Pacheco's house, leaving mud everywhere. Most of his things are beyond saving. The neighbor's house is now planted in Pacheco's back patio. All my life I've lived here and I've never seen anything like this before, he says. We've had ocean surges, but not like this. Despite all the aid deliveries, very little of it has come here, even though Santa Clara is very close to the epicenter. The Chilean military is making its first visit. We've just arrived here now to assess the situation, says Major Christian Carrillo. This community of 3,000s received a few bags of food, a little water, and that's it. As we leave, federal politicians and officials make their first appearance, bringing only promises and plans to a community getting impatient for food, water and help. Connie Watson, CBC News, Santa Clara, Chile. The quake that struck Chile was so powerful, it altered the Earth's axis and permanently shortened the day by 1.2 millionths of a second. And both it and the one in Haiti were also caused by the same natural phenomenon, the movement of the Earth's tectonic plates. In Haiti, the deadly quake was caused by the North American and Caribbean tectonic plates grinding against each other. In Chile, it was caused by the Nazca plate pushing under the South American one. Just like off the coast of British Columbia, the Juan de Fuca plate is pushing under the North American plate, which, as the CBC's Eve Savory reports, means a big earthquake in B.C. is just a matter of time. 
Beautiful British Columbia, they call it, but those who live along its coast know they may pay a price for that beauty. The same geologic processes that created the mountains and fjords put people at risk. We will have a devastating earthquake. We've had them in the past, and we undoubtedly will have them again in the future. BC isn't the only place with the shakes. Communities along the Ottawa Valley and the St. Lawrence Seaway also should be preparing for a big quake. But BC is seismic central. Last month, Gary Rogers and colleagues at the Pacific Geoscience Centre released important clues about how and when that devastating quake could happen. Victoria is normally, normally going towards Vancouver or Toronto and by its building up strain for the next big earthquake. But what we find is that it actually backs up every 14 months, then goes forward and backs up every 14 months. We know the Juan de Fuca plate is moving four centimeters a year, sliding and sticking under the North American plate. If it snaps back every 14 months, that may be the critical time. Every time that happens, the stress that was over this big area gets added to this locked area. That's the time when it's most likely to fail, or the big earthquake's most likely to happen. So how prepared is BC for the big one? These are loose. Jay Lewis of Terra Firm is a consultant on how to make the inside of a building safe. He says the high rises of Vancouver are built to sway and survive, but there's more to a building than concrete, glass and steel. All the things that are inside close to all of this glass go shooting right out through the glass. Everything from computer monitors to filing cabinets to bookshelves they come down into the street, uh, onto the sidewalk, which can be a killing zone at that point. In many of the world's earthquakes, it's the schools that crumble. That got Tracy Monk, a physician, wondering about BC schools. I was astonished when I looked into it because BC is certainly considered as very proactive in the international hazard mitigation community. And uh, we had mitigated bridges and tunnels and dams and the liquor branch and the prisons, but somehow we hadn't done the schools. And this astonished me. So many BC schools were in danger, it turned Tracy Monk into an activist. Eventually, she forced the province to commit one and a half billion dollars to upgrade them, a task that will take 15 years. There's a very good chance that we're going to experience a large earthquake. Yet individually and as communities, the province's citizens are far ahead of Ottawa and Montreal in taking responsibility, taking courses, getting prepared. If you're in a hallway, you can actually brace your back against one side of the wall. This is Earthquake 101, the ABCs. And then there are the uber prepared. Lionel, a photographer who asked us not to use his last name, teaches this stuff. I store a wrench in motor oil. A wrench to turn off the gas if the line ruptures. Strapping to keep the hot water tank upright. And tucked up next to an invincible wall, his earthquake kit. Boots ready. Water for 40 days. Food for 60 for his family of four. This is a man who warns after a big quake, toilet paper will be currency, duct tape, gold. He says everyone benefits if everyone is prepared. If you have more people prepared and able to survive comfortably an earthquake, you're going to have better neighborhoods post-earthquake. Earthquakes are not unusual in Canada. The country is shaken by about 2,500 a year, most of them too small to feel. And British Columbia may be better prepared for a big earthquake than other parts of the country. But is it prepared enough? In 2004, an earthquake off Indonesia caused a massive tsunami that killed hundreds of thousands of people. And as the CBC's Chris Brown reported, that led some Canadian scientists to change their predictions and issue new warnings about what might happen if a tsunami hit BC. So calm, so much potential for destruction. One year later, the implications of a faraway catastrophe are lost on no one living near Victoria's waterfront. 
Well, I'm hoping it doesn't happen here. And I hope it doesn't reach my, reach my house when it comes. Those enormous waves that pounded Southeast Asia were generated by geological conditions practically identical to Canada's west coast and which scientists are now using to better predict the path and implications of a Pacific tsunami. BC's emergency planners have been going with the assumption that any ground 10 meters or higher is safe. Maybe not though. There is now a vigorous scientific debate over just how high the waves from a giant west coast tsunami could get. Research scientist David Mosier was part of an international team that analyzed the crack in the Indian Ocean floor that produced the immense 9.0 quake. The rupture, he says, was nearly twice the size as scientists initially thought. We can say it seems like it probably moved on the order of 10 or 15 meters vertically, uh, somewhat like 40 meters horizontally. That information has led some tsunami modelers to revise their thinking about a huge earthquake off BC. The current model predicts maximum wave heights of 10 meters hitting Vancouver Island's west coast, between 1 to 4 meters around Victoria, with only minimal effects near Vancouver. The Indian Ocean experience now suggests waves could be twice or even three times higher. If the Juan de Fuca Strait, uh, depending on the direction of the wave, were to propagate a wave and, and maybe even amplify it, uh, similar to a, to a tidal bore, then, then that wave uh, could impact Victoria perhaps even more severely than we suspect. Worst case, parts of BC's capital would be inundated. But other scientists suggest that is alarmist, and until more research is done on things like the impact of the seabed and the coastline on tsunami waves, there is no need to panic. Emergency planners agree for now. We build all kinds of conservatism into the emergency plans around tsunamis, and then we'll rely in the future on, on additional information coming from our scientific partners. Still, the latest research offers plenty for scientists and the planners to mull over as they contemplate the consequences of the West Coast's next big one. Chris Brown, CBC News, Victoria. Over the years, British Columbia has stepped up preparations to deal with the threat lurking off its shore. Movements along the Juan de Fuca plate are closely monitored, and new buildings must be constructed so they can dissipate the energy of a quake which includes steel cages to prevent concrete from breaking away, special springs and large diagonal braces. The building will rock back and forth and the diagonal braces will push this little link beam between the tops of these two back and forth and bend it and flex it and it'll be all broken up but the building will be safe. Schools have regular earthquake drills and the city of Vancouver even has a plan to take care of pets in the aftermath of an earthquake. But being prepared is one thing, and predicting when an earthquake will hit is another, as the CBC's Chris Brown found out after the earthquake in Haiti. Predicting earthquakes is still an inexact science. When the big quake hit Haiti, one of Canada's foremost earthquake experts saw his needle go wild. This is a minute of shaking. Incredibly, John Cassidy's instruments on Vancouver Island even picked up the rumblings. But what he nor any other earthquake scientist anywhere could do was provide a warning. Earthquake prediction saying exactly how large an earthquake will be, exactly where and exactly when, those three pieces of information that you need. Uh, is elusive. In some cases, animals do seem to get a short heads up, but perhaps only a matter of seconds. This video shows a frightened dog sensing the sound wave that preceded a 6.5 magnitude quake that hit California on Sunday. Indeed, sound may be part of the prediction right. puzzle, which is why at the University of Toronto's right. Rock Fracture Lab, they're studying how rocks break under pressure and listening to the sounds they make just before they do. That is the main trend to understand, basically, to listen to fracture. Or at the earthquake field level, um, there's there are a lot, a lot more to be done. Sometimes there are tremors before the big one, which happened in the Chinese city of Haichung in 1975. They evacuated the city and saved thousands of lives, but that now appears to have been a lucky one-off. No one has got it right since, although not from a lack of trying.
The last massive earthquake to hit British Columbia is believed to have occurred in January 1700. And the geological record shows that those kind of earthquakes occur on average about every 500 years. So the one sure thing that can be said is that each day takes us closer to the next one. And that's News and Review. Don't forget to check out our website at newsandreview.cbclearning.ca. I'm Carla Robinson. Thanks for watching. It's quite a concern to think that you could be in a situation where your accelerator is jammed and you can't stop the car. This is an exceptional circumstance. We are moving at lightning speed to create that confidence with our consumers for the vehicles that they're driving and for the brand. A giant car maker struggles to recover from a series of safety issues. At stake is everything they have ever gained in their history, their reputation, their uh, brand equity, and, and all the other assets that they have. On News and Review today.